Hello. My name is Hannah Wolitschek. I'm a historian of biology, and I'd like to invite you to join my forthcoming seminar revolving around one question. Does epistemic object choice shape valuation of knowledge in cell biology? In 1962, the editors of the Quarterly Journal of Microscopical Science published a bold statement, quote, there is one feature of present day functional morphology, which is indeed new, namely the availability of powerful new methods for studying the structure of living machinery. The electron phase contrast and polarizing microscopes, autoradiography, histochemistry, and so on. These are cytological methods, and it is primarily at the level of cytology and fine structure that important new advances in the study of living machinery are likely to occur. Much cytological work now being published is essentially descriptive, the enthusiastic description of objects. This is a necessary phase, and it would not be an exaggeration to say that almost the whole of invertebrate and vertebrate microscopy is now waiting to be done afresh at the new level of physical and chemical discrimination. Quote end. I interpret this appraisal of descriptive work as an urge to thoroughly establish cellular phenomena before explanatory work on mechanisms, molecular or otherwise, becomes meaningful. And I interpret the body of knowledge produced by such work as knowledge libraries, analogous to anatomical atlases, but on the resolution level of the cell and its molecular constituents. In 2013, a cell biologist stated that perhaps we also need a new wave of descriptive research to define new problems. It is not clear that the classical descriptions were exhaustive. No one knows the right way ahead, but each new laboratory should be a small experiment in that direction, both end. If you compare just these two statements, they suggest that there have been periods in cell biology when producing descriptive knowledge had been anonymously valued. But when subjected to a historiographic scrutiny, it turns out that after the formational phase of the modern discipline of cell biology in the 1950s and the enthusiastic description of cellular fine structure by electron microscopy, such knowledge has been judged ambivalently. On the one hand, as a prerequisite to allow for the inquiry of functional questions about cells, increasingly developing into a mechanistic imperative. On the other hand, it was frequently considered as at least second-tier research, lacking the basis of mechanistic hypothesis and experimentally perturbing of cell functions. This observation provokes questions about how researchers frame their knowledge for the intended audience to allow for publication in general cell biology journals promising the highest reputation, as opposed to other periodicals. Conceptualizing such knowledge as the product of biological engineering offers a historiographic tool to investigate such strategies of framing. Irrespective of the underlying epistemic interest of the scientists themselves, which might have been driven by an enthusiasm for the development and mastery of new methodologies, and consequently defining biological engineering as their epistemic interest, they may have chosen to present the cellular phenomenon as the real epistemic object in question to sell the methodology. There is no doubt that new methods and their associated knowledge libraries have been valued and constantly applied if they have proven to be useful. But this was not necessarily the case for the individuals providing them. By investigating historical dynamics of framing biological engineering and its epistemic products, within the logic of dominant epistemic imperatives of one discipline, the idea of disciplinary epistemic standards and fashions of inquiry become fragile. This is especially relevant if they are reconstructed by historians and philosophers through the dominating and most prestigious periodicals of one discipline. I argue that we would benefit from revisiting our ideas of these historic epistemic standards and fashions as an interplay between a relatively small number of individuals setting those standards 
and the community enforcing them by intentionally adapting their presented knowledge according to this framework in their manuscripts submitted for publication. In this seminar, I will probe different cases of such framings and contexts to think about biological engineering in a perspective that considers tensions between and entanglements of knowledge producers and their intended or unintended audience. And I invite you to discuss historiographical and philosophical consequences of this perspective. I'm looking forward to see you there. <laughs>